Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Bill Clinton got it almost right when he said, it's the economy, stupid. But it's more than that. It might be more accurate to say it's capitalism, stupid, the system that took 13 disparate colonies and in 400 years became the most powerful economic engine on the planet. How this happened, why it happened, is not an accident, but the result of some very specific events and decisions and attitudes. Equally true is that there's no guarantee it will be forever. In today's world, we either keep up or we don't. Just as we stole much of our model from Great Britain, Others are closing in on us. We also face greater threats from within, as every day the word socialism creeps into the political dialogue. Today we have 5% of the world's population, and yet represent 20% of the world's patents and 25% of the world's economy. Going forward, that may not always be the case. To the extent that what has passed is prologue, it's worth taking a look at the history of capitalism in America to see if we can indeed keep it going. We're going to talk about this with my guest, Adrian Woolridge. Adrian Woolridge is the economist political editor. He's the author of nine previous books, has a doctorate in history from Oxford, and has co-authored a new book with Alan Greenspan entitled Capitalism in America, A History. Adrian Woolridge, thanks so much for joining us once again. Thank you for inviting me. A delight to have you here. One of the things that, that's clear in looking at this broad scope of the history of capitalism in America, that there really are some clear ideas and clear themes that repeat themselves over and over again through the American history of capitalism. Talk about that in a broad sense, first of all. Yeah, I mean, it's extraordinary the continuities that you see in, in America. And the fundamental continuity, which we argue that you see in this book, is uh, a greater tolerance for creative destruction than any other country in the world. America celebrates new products, new innovations, i.e. creation, and it tolerates the destructive, the downside of, of things. And it, because it, it, it tolerates create and indeed celebrates creative destruction more than anybody else, it's actually grown faster and, and, and been more dynamic, particularly in new industries. Now, this tolerance of creative destruction, I want to say, manifests itself in two ways. One is the cult of the entrepreneur. America um, admires entrepreneurs more than any other country. So in Britain, the great ideal is to become a landowner, an aristocrat, you know, have your own Downton Abbey. In France, the great ideal is to become a sort of intellectual, smoke your gitan, sit on a, in a cafe in uh, Paris and talk about the meaning of life like Jean-Paul Sartre. In Germany, the great aim is to become a, you know, a scholar, a professor, hair professor, doctor, doctor, and the rest of it. In America, the great aim is now, and has always been, I think, to be an entrepreneur, a businessman, somebody who creates um, a, a new product, a new, a, a new way of doing things and becomes a celebrated entrepreneur. That was the case in the um, 1860s with Carnegie and Rockefeller. It was the case, is the case now with Bezos and the rest of them. No other country celebrates businessmen as much. And the other thing is no other country makes it so easy to create companies and to, and to make companies not just just vibrant, but big to, to create huge companies. And America has always had, America was actually created by companies such as the, the Massachusetts Bay Company, the Plymouth Company, the Virginia Bay Company. It was actually the creation of companies. It was the first uh, country in the world to make it easy to create companies, which they did in the 1820s and 1830s. And it was the first company, country to create giant organizations which employed far more people in the government as you know carnegie in 1900 is employing 250,000 people far more than the american government is employing so america is a land of, of business heroes and a land of corporations always been that and still is that and many points along the way particularly has as there has been more creative destruction it has created an internal tension in the country, a friction. And those, po those have been really critical inflection points in the history of the country at large and of capitalism in the country in particular. Absolutely. What we argue in, 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 in what we say in this book is that this is a, a book with the politics in it. We say anybody who wants to read a book with the politics left out is reading the wrong book. Politics is very important because what creative destruction always does, partly because it creates winners and losers, and partly just because it creates a lot of change and churn and, and that is disorienting, is it creates a popular reaction against creative destruction. So you have movements. 
demanding change. You had the, the rise of the prairie radicals in, in, in urban communities. You had the rise of the progressive intellectuals. And you had the rise of the labor unions saying, slow down, change things. Let's have political intervention to change the nature of the system. And one of the things we argue is that America has always set more limits on the extent to which politicians can, change, can, can, can meddle with the system than, say, um, Latin American countries have or European countries have. So politicians have mattered. They've changed things a lot, but they've never over-interfered in the way that they have in many other countries. One of the things you talk about is that is the importance of this tolerance for creative destruction. Sure. And that even in sure. periods where it hasn't been embraced necessarily, there has been a tolerance. And arguably, in the current environment, we're seeing perhaps less of that tolerance. Yeah, one of the things we argue in this book is, 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 is America's comparative advantage has been this willingness to celebrate or at least tolerate creative destruction. As have even been in the bad times, like in the 19, 1970s and the 1930s, it's been less willing to, to just get rid of the system and, 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 and start again than, than other countries. But now what you're beginning to see in America is a lessening of this tolerance for creative destruction. If you look at figures for geographical mobility, America's at its low point for 50 years, fewer and fewer people moving around. If you look at the amount of number of companies that are being created at its lowest point for, since the 1970s, people are not creating as many companies. If you look at regulations, they're much more pervasive. It used to be the case in 1950, only 5% of American jobs required licenses to do them. Now it's 30% of jobs required li occupational licenses. If you look at how long it takes to, to build an infra, FDR built the Golden Great Bridge in four years. Now it takes four years even to begin to start the process of, uh, of doing everything. So it's becoming more encrusted with rules and regulations, more resistant to change, more stagnant, more like a European economy or the British economy and less like the uh, American economy, which, is, uh, which, is, which we celebrate in this book. Yet the irony is that in some ways, perhaps in technology for sure, but in, in other areas as well, the system is getting more and more complex and therefore less people really understand how to make those levers work and less people benefit from it. Absolutely. It's not just that technology is becoming more complex because, of course, it is. But, of course, regulations are right. just staggeringly complex. In Britain, it's very, very unusual for somebody to hire somebody to help them with their taxes. In America, it's more than half the population who do that because the tax code is fantastically complicated. In area after area after area, you have regulations which are out of control and which are so out of control that people can't understand them. So you have to employ professionals to understand them. You have to employ lobbyists to try and twist them. Um, you, you know, you need a, a simplification of the regulatory code uh, in America, that would do you a great deal of, deal of good because, of course, the, the technology is complicated and the, the, the modern sophisticated economy is complicated, but you've got unnecessary government uh, complications thrown in on top of that. One of the important things to understand, and you point this out at various points in the history of capitalism, is that you can't have growth successfully without the destruction part of it. Absolutely. It's almost the case that the creative destruction is destruction that is creative, that these two things are Siamese twins. You can't have one without the other. And many countries have tried to have that. They've tried to have um, growth without disruption. They want to minimize the disruption, maximize the growth. Europe has tried to do that by planning growth. Latin America has tried to do that by bashing the rich and saying it's all a matter of just redistributing wealth. And what you tend to do when you do that is you kill both the creation and the destruction, and you tend to have a, a stagnant economy. The other thing is many people are worried about dynamic economies because dynamic economies create winners and losers. But actually, when you have a stagnant economy, you create far more losers because you're not getting any growth. If you look at Venezuela, uh, if you look at um, uh, Russia in the 1980s after the Soviet experiment, they had far more uh, losers, a uh, much bigger permanent underclass than America has ever, ever had um, because there's, they, there's no upside, there's no creativity. Now, um, we, we, let me try and emphasize that, that we're not trying to say there are no warts in the American uh, system. There are terrible things that have happened. The, the treatment of the Aboriginal population was appalling. The existence of slavery was appalling. Um, there have been periods when you know, financial crises have 
have created a lot of unnecessary suffering. But what we say is that overall, um, because of a willingness to embrace innovation um, and creative destruction, America has, up until now, had a much higher growth rate and therefore a higher standard of living than any other country in the world, which is why 5% of the population um, produce 25% of the world's uh, GDP. How is this changed by virtue of globalization, essentially, by virtue of the free flow of money, of capital, of ideas around the world? Well, in a sense, America was uh, one of the first global, uh, first economies to experiment with what we now call globalization, um, because it was the first country to create a huge single market over a continent-sized country, because although America did have tariffs, it was in some ways protected from the rest of the world, it was, a, it was the world's biggest internal market um, in, the, in, in the 19th century, by far the world's biggest internal market. Then America begins to um, engage with the rest of the world after 1900, begins to uh, become more and more dependent on trade and have closer relations with the rest of the global economy, having built up this internal market. And it does this stupid thing in 1930, which is the Smoot-Hawley tariff. It introduces this tariff. And the result of this tariff is that it damages its own economy and it damages the economy of the rest of the world because the rest of the world also embraces tariffs and that creates a downward spiral. So it's deglobalization, as it were, the embrace of trade barriers in the 1930s, which helped uh, uh, drive this downward spiral in the 30s. Then uh, again, in the 1970s and 80s, America embraces globalization, um, resists pressure to, to, um, to put out those tariffs, and that creates a lot of problems for um, old established companies, such as the car companies and steel companies, um, which have quite frankly been rather lazy and have sat on their lead and have not been innovating, but it also provides huge opportunities for new companies, such as the computer companies that come at that time in Silicon Valley. So so uh, globalization is a complicated story, but it's generally a story which means that, that efficient, well-run companies um, have the, 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 you know, the world to export to, and badly run companies are forced to improve. And if you look at what happened with the car industry, the American car industry in the 1970s is pretty awful. Um, it does improve enormously because of being forced to compete with Japan and Germany. Talk a little bit about the financial sector and the way creative destruction has played a role there or hasn't in some cases, really as, sure. as, as a capital source and also an equity source within this larger picture. Sure. I mean, the, 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 the financial system is creative destruction on stilts. That, that, that the financial system is incredibly good for creation. It seeks out efficiencies. It allocates money to new area, areas um, with enormous efficiency. So if you look at the development of Silicon Valley and the entrepreneurial culture of the 1980s in, in, in the United States, that happened to a goodly extent because America had better capital markets, better sources of more diverse sources of money than any other country in the world. So it's very, very good uh, for allocating um, money to new growth areas. But it's also... Um, tends to be ex very exaggerated when it comes to destruction as well because people, you know, you have herd instincts, you have fear, and you have people abandoning their positions very quickly. So you tend to overshoot on the destruction side as well. So, you know, America history has been characterized by very efficient allocation of, of money and resources to new areas, but also overshooting on the downside with, with, with uh, depression. So in, in, in 1929, that was a huge blow to the economy because, um, because people, uh, you know, abandoned their positions. They got panicked. There was a panic uh, on Wall Street. In 2008, you had exactly the same thing going on. So what you need to do, you, you don't want to suppress the financial system because the financial system is vital to allocating money, to, to, to allocating resources to, um, to growth. But you also want to make sure that it can't overshoot on the downside. So what we allocate in, advocate in this book is that banks are forced to preserve much bigger shares of their assets as equity. So they're protected against contagious defaults. And if you go into, up into the great uh, 
2008 crisis, I think you had banks with less than 10% of, of their um, resources as equity, in some cases much less than that. We advocate that they have 25% to 30%, which means that they're much better protected against contagious defaults and against the system overshooting on the downside. One of the things that has protected capitalism in America in many ways is is arguably the lack of competition. I mean, I suppose there was this great fear in the 1980s that Japan was going to overtake us, that that was going to change everything. That turned out to not be true, and it, it's created a certain smugness in the American economy since. Well, I mean, what, what the American economy was fantastically dominant in the world after 1945, you know, producing, you know, more than half the world's manufactured goods. The rest of Europe is devastated. I mean, Europe is devastated. Much of Asia is devastated. And America is dominant in the 60s and 70s and is producing uh, in the 50s, 60s and 70s and, and is producing fantastic stuff, but it gets lazy and it gets complacent and it begins to, to, to produce bad stuff, not very safe cars, um, not very innovative cars. And then suddenly it's hit with com global competition from Japan and Germany uh, and other rising Asian powers. And the impact of that is devastating in some ways, but also America learns from that. It improves its management systems. It improves its innovative ability. You get better cars, you get better steel, and you get better electronics. So, um, so complacency is beaten out of the, the system. Um, so um, it's um, an ability to change is the, is the most important thing. But um, that's not an easy process, but ultimately it's, 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 it's necessary. And how does that same idea play out when we look at the, the global competition with China today? Well, it's very interesting. Um, you know, you said that in the in the 70s, everybody was convinced that Japan was going to become the world's uh, dominant power. And that Japan very rapidly faded. That's partly because Japan was badly run internally, but it's partly because America learned from Japan and it imitated many of Japan's best management methods, uh, the Toyota production system, just in time, Kaizen and the rest of it. Um, and America looked at Japan and said that first it said, let's build up protective barriers to stop them out competing us. But then it did something much more sensible and said, let's learn from them. And let's improve the quality of our production. And I think with China, um, uh, America is confronted by a formidable adversary. The best way to deal with that is is not to build up protectionist barriers. Um, I think that the, the tariffs are wrong. I do think it's the case that the Chinese have often bent or twisted or cheated the system, particularly when it comes to Americans setting up um, companies, uh, subsidiary companies in China. And they've made it very difficult to do that, and, and, and they, they, they need to face some reckoning over that. Ultimately, I don't think China will, will take the place of America as the world's leading uh, power, because I think that China is not an innovative company, uh, country, not as innovative as the United States, because it's very hard to combine high degrees of innov innovative flair with an authoritarian political system. It's never been done before in the past, and I'm not sure it can be, can be done in the future. We argue in this book, essentially, that the American economy is a very powerful economy, that the American entrepreneurial spirit, uh, ability to create giant corporations, small companies that become giant companies, is an unrivaled advantage. What's wrong with America is a policy problem. There are very many policies that have gone wrong. Um, government, as it were, is broken. Your entitlement system is broken. It's out of control. It's badly designed. It's allocating too much money to the, to the, to, to be, to, to the wrong people. Um, it needs to be adjusted in terms of people's life expectancies, in terms of their ability to, to pay. It's a policy problem, not a problem with the fundamental economic engine. And if you can get that policy mixture right, uh, the future lies with America, not with, with China. It's also a regulation problem. I mean, you talk about yeah, that sure. in the book. Yeah, America um, has become a highly regulated, but also a badly regulated society. I quoted earlier the fact that um, the number of occupations that require a license has gone from 5% to 30%. Um, a lot of these um, licenses, uh, you know, you need to get a license to be a hair cutter or an interior designer. 
you know, it takes two years, it takes four years, it takes a long time to get these qualifications. And there are all sorts of reasons that, 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 that are given, which I think are, tend to be rather spurious. Again, if you want to build houses, if you want to build bridges, if you want to engage in construction, it's a very long drawn out process. It's, um, it, it's, it's difficult, it's time consuming. Uh, and even when it comes to, to, to corporations to set up and to run companies, you've got a massive increase in, 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 in regulatory burden because of Sarbanes-Oxley and Dodd-Frank. And most of those burdens fall most heavily on small companies because small, you know, it's a higher proportion of, uh, of your companies. What, what regulation is, is, that, is, is a tax on the two most important things that entrepreneurs have, which is their time and their ability to innovate. And you're, you're taking up all their time with regulations and you're taking away their ability to innovate because more and more of the economy is, 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 is cut off from them. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't have regulations, um, but as I, the example I'm using of, of requiring uh, financial institutions to preserve much more, uh, to have much more bigger equity buffers, I would do that that's a simple regulation, and then get rid of the 2,000 pages of Sarbanes Ox, uh, of, of Dodd Frank at the same same time. So smart regulation, precise regulation, not this this over ill thought out and sprawling regulation that you've got now. I think you know regulation is an opportunity. It's a tax on entrepreneurs, but it's also an opportunity for incumbents to um, twist the system in their favor and make, um, make it more difficult for challenges to come along. Adrian Woolridge, the book is Capitalism in America, a History. He's the co-author with Alan Greenspan. Adrian, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.